Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're chatting with Oliver Josiah from the Ministry of Meeples, a company he started with his partner, Charlotte, as a side project while they were finishing their postgraduate studies. Their first game, The Urgy, is currently live on Kickstarter. Oliver, welcome to The Binge. How are you doing? Thanks, James. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is great having you. I saw this game and I was pretty excited by it. it we're going to get into this in a little bit, but this is a really beefy game. I guess would be the words I would use. There is there is a lot in, in, in the mm. box, so to speak. But before we get there, tell me, where did all this begin? How did you get into gaming in the first place? <laughs> um, so, so I've kind of been into gaming since quite young. Um, playing board games is something that sort of me, my brother and my dad did a lot growing up. Um, the first kind of games that we sort of got really into were fairly light games, games like um, Ticket to Ride, sort of classic. Yep. That's all what we started Gateway off games. with. Yeah, Gateway Games. We sort of moved up to um, Agricola. Agricola is a family favorite that we still mm. play again and again. Um, whenever I get the chance to visit my dad, that's a game that we always play sort of two or three times. Um, so we sort of built up a bit of a collection of games um, growing up. Um, so I, I run the Ministry of Meeples with my partner Charlotte and, and Charlotte sort of co-designed the game as well. Um, and really she kind of got into games when I introduced sort of board games to her at university. So she sort of came a little bit later, but she um, sort of got a baptism by fire where I was showing her all the <laughs> games. And <laughs> unfortunately she was really into it. And what'd you guys take when you were in school? Um, so I studied philosophy, nice. um, which is obviously very practical, very useful, sets you up for a career in the board game industry. <laughs> um, and Charlotte studied Russian. Oh, Russian. wow. Yeah. Uh, and what was the goal there? Like studying Russian, was that to be part of the UN or? <laughs> um, so Charlotte's incredibly academic. Um, yeah. I think she's, yeah, she's just studying Russian literature for the, for the academic side. Uh, Cause she really enjoys the, enjoys the subject. Wow. Yeah. And so when you guys um, started this game and we're going to talk at the end, kind of about the lessons learned, cause this is your second time through mm -hmm. with this particular game. Um, how long have you been working on this game? So has this been a couple years in the making, longer? Like where did it all the game itself kind of start the ideation around it? Uh, so I first sort of came up with the really basic idea of the game about three years ago. So it was during my master's. I was just, because we obviously play a lot of games and I was like, oh, yeah. it'd be really cool to, to design one. And I had this idea that I sort of scribbled down on, on paper. Um, and I thought, oh, it'd be really cool if this could actually sort of become something more than just an idea in my head. I'd love to sort of make this something. Um, so I, I showed Charlotte sort of the basic idea, expecting her to go, well, you know what, Ollie, this is fun, but totally unrealistic. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Um, but instead, she very foolishly said, actually, this, this looks really good. Let's, <laughs> let's give it a go. Let's work on it together. Um, so that's kind of the, the origin story of the game. It was just, yeah, an idea that ended up. Now, did part of the philosophy, your, your studies, is part of that uh, kind of play into this at all? Like this whole idea of maybe a God complex of what if I was the God or what, what was it that kind of inspired it? I don't know if uh, the God stuff came from studying philosophy or just sort of my own natural God complex. <laughs> um, so, so I think studying philosophy definitely influenced the game in yeah. some way. The kind of philosophy that I was most interested in was sort of the philosophy of logic and the philosophy of mathematics and thinking a lot about probability um, and sort of, yeah, sort of optimal systems. Um, so that kind of side of, of philosophy got sort of involved in the game as I was trying to sort of thinking about the various probabilities and thinking about sort of how moves could be optimized. Um, I was really interested in decision theory and game theory as part of philosophy. So that definitely got involved. Um, but I don't, I don't think sort of the, the core content of philosophy heavily influenced the game too much. And then in, in making this game, um, was like, did the, did you hire outsource the artwork or, you know, did you do the initial kind of setup? Like how did you kind of frame it out? And was it on tabletop simulator or did you literally cut out pieces of paper and, and make prototypes or how did you come about actually making the game itself? 
<laughs> right. So yeah, the early prototypes um, were just <laughs> bits of paper that we scribbled on, um, cutting out lots of card with the scissors and then sticking bits of paper onto them with glue. Um, there have got, got some photos sort of on the website of me, um, sort of by lamplight, cutting things out late <laughs> into the night. <laughs> That's very much how, um, how the game started. And then we sort of used that prototype to show our, our friends and, um, and eventually starting to sort of show board game groups. Um, we were really lucky that sort of this was obviously going back three years. We were at university at the time and we were living with sort of quite a large group of people. So we just had access to, to people that were happy to, to play test quite a lot. Um, so it meant that the game managed to sort of get going and reach a decent stage faster than I think some designers are able to, to do because we just yeah had ready and willing play testers almost 24-7. <laughs> And at what point did you say, you know, I think that like, was a plan always to do Kickstarter with this game or was it a game that you want to create more just for fun with you and your friends? And then that's, you thought, geez, there's something here. Maybe we can do this on Kickstarter. When did that decision kind of come into play? Yeah, absolutely. So it started off just as a, I really want this kind of game. And then maybe I'll talk more about sort of the kind of game it is later, but I was like, oh, this sure. is the kind of game that I really want. Um, and there's nothing that I know yet, which is kind of filling this thing that I want. So I'll make it and, and play it and have a good time with my friends. Um, and then, um, yeah, we just sort of got, got quite proud of it. Um, we thought about sending it off to a publisher, but we were coming to the end of our studies and we were like, we've got a little bit of time. Maybe we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll invest this time in, in putting together a, a Kickstarter campaign. Um, wow. And now you're, you're based out of London, I guess, yeah? Um, right now, yeah. Normally we're, we're in Lowestoft, but sort of circumstances have landed us in, Lo in London for, um, for a while. So yeah. was COVID, was that part of it or was it access to kind of resources or what kind of brought you to, to London in the first place? Right. So the, the simple answer is good internet. <laughs> Running a Kickstarter campaign, you definitely need to have a really sort of solid internet connection. Um, and Lowestoft is lovely and sort of where we live in Lowestoft is really, really nice, but um, the internet is very slow. Um, oh so during our our first campaign, we were based in Lowestoft, and we just had a nightmare uploading graphics, trying to make changes. Um, it was, yeah, <laughs> we learned our lesson there, and we're like, okay, next time we need to be somewhere where we can upload something in faster than 24 hours. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's slow. I mean, that's, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, even, even so, like uh, mm. today's day and age, like think of like Tabletop Simulator, for instance, mm. right? To use Tabletop Simulator, you have to have a decent computer and you have to have a decent connection or that thing is going to crawl, right? Like mm -hmm. it is, uh, it uses up a lot of space in your computer and a lot of kind of memory. And it, you know, my computer, yeah. I think is steaming when it's, when it's running. So I could just imagine trying to run that from somewhere where you have spotty internet or, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of out in a remote area. So, you know, now you're in London, now you're locked down. <laughs> Right. You're in the heart of London, yeah. but right. pros and cons. <laughs> pros and cons. You're there. You got the fast internet, but you can't leave your house. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, exactly. there's 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 pluses and minuses to each. So, all right. So let's talk about theurgy. So first, the name theurgy. There. What does that mean? Theurgy. Um, cool. So the word theurgy means the operation or effect of a divine or supernatural agency in human affairs, um, which is a little bit of a mouthful. So so yeah, this basically means. Uh, divine supernatural stuff happening in the world mm -hmm. that's uh yeah that's the meaning of the word and i'm going to share my screen for people who are watching and uh, if you're listening i encourage you to uh go to boardgamebinge.com you can check out all of our back catalog or hey why not join our facebook group board game binge and you can catch these interviews live and see exactly what we're looking at right now so walk us through um, how to play. And just before I actually do that, even, I just want to congratulate you. You've actually hit your target already. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm going to show some Canadian dollars because I'm in Canada. So that's the only way I can see it for one. Number two, it always sounds bigger. Um, mm -hmm. So you've hit $42,000 on roughly $35,000 um, uh, target, 424 backers. That's nothing to sneeze at. And you still got 22 days to go. So you guys, uh, for lack of a better saying, I mean, this is a successful campaign and it's just going to get stronger and stronger. So Congrats on that to start off with. Now take us through the game. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we're really pleased. And actually, it's so nice to see it in Canadian dollars as well. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel really good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so the game, of course, yeah, is called Theogy, um, and we've sort of taglined it there, the area control game of Monsters and Miracles. 
So the premise of the game is that each player is taking on the role of a totally fictitious but sort of half forgotten god um, who wants to reestablish their name, sort of regain their former glory. Uh, so it's an area control game. Each god has at their disposal two loyal acolytes who travel around the world, travel from settlement to settlement um, on these epic pilgrimages, preaching to the non-believers, performing miracles, fighting monsters, fantastical monsters are summoned during the course of the game. And ultimately the aim of the game is to be the first player to meet one of three victory conditions. Hmm. Um, and all of these victory conditions involve building temples. Um, so the first victory condition is sort of a, a king of the hill style victory condition. You want a temple in the central capital, hmm. and then you only need a small number of temples. Um, an alternative victory condition is meeting your own sort of personal secret objective, which you've been dealt. Um, and then you need slightly more temples, but still not too many. Um, and then the third victory condition is just having tons of temples. So if you can't build in the capital, you can't meet your objective, you just go for as, as many temples as I, as I can. Um, and the exact number of temples varies with the, with the player count. Um, so that's the kind of the aim of the game. In terms of sort of the game's structure, um, each player on their turn has four actions to choose from. Um, so there's pilgrimage, spread the word, divine intervention, and test the faith. Um, so on your turn, you're always performing one of these four actions. Um, a little bit like Scythe, you can never sort of take the same action on the next turn. So, mm. so most of the game, you've got sort of three options to choose from, um, which means that the game sort of tends to, to go around the table fairly quickly. Um, so super quickly, sort of pilgrimage is, is basically how you, you move your pieces around the board, get them into good positions, and you can gain some followers by preaching on your, on your pilgrimage. So how's that work? Yeah, how do you get the followers? Uh, you're adding more cubes, I guess, which are meeples, depending on which version of the game you go with. But how do you get those extra players? Right. So the game, the board starts off populated by by non-believers. So sort of mm. in the outer ring, there are these sort of rural villages that start off with a small number of believers. And as you sort of go towards the capital, um, there are more believers than the capital, um, and more non-believers. And then in the capital, there's sort of there's a large number of of the population. Um, and so you're swapping them out then? So like you'll go yeah. onto a spot and then if they're non-believers, you preach to them, they become believers, you swap with those cubes for maybe your color, I guess, so that you can now claim that they're now following you as a god. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can also do this with other people's believers as well. So oh, cool. <laughs> try and yeah, you find someone else's following, you move your acolyte in, you preach to them, you convert them. Um, but people can prevent you from doing this if they've got their own acolyte there so that the position of your acolyte becomes really quite important. Um, not only to sort of prevent people from sort of converting away your, the following that you've already got, but to gain more followers to do other things with your acolytes later as well. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a sort of positional positional game. And the divine intervention, what is that? Is that kind of like a, like a superpower card that you you play that allows you to rain thunder down on somebody, or what's the <laughs> right? Yeah. So. Um... So yeah, the divine intervention action is when you're either using an acolyte to perform a miracle or you're summoning a monster um, into the land. So miracles are these kind of one-time dramatic effects. Um, they tend to be location specific. So you need to kind of get your acolyte to the place where you want the miracle to occur. And you play this, this card and it has a, a sort of a big, uh, a big effect there. Um, monsters are summoned onto the board and then they, they stay there. Um, and some of them move around, some of them set up their lairs um, and they have an effect. Some of them have these kind of permanent effects which just, you don't need to do anything with, they're sort of permanently affecting the board. And some of these monsters have these active effects which you can reactivate each time you go on divine intervention on the future. Um, so this kind of means that as the more monsters you've got, the more sort of powerful your divine interventions become. So there's kind of this element of engine building in the game. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not totally straightforward because other people can slay your monsters. Um, if they manage to get their acolyte to where you've got a monster, they can use their acolyte to, to, to get rid of your, your new pet. Um, so again, you want to position your own acolytes to defend your monsters as well. So it's sort of engine building, but with a, a slight twist. Now, and there's a, a solo version, right? Like an AI. So how does the AI work? How, did, uh, how, how was that built in? Was that always built in from the beginning or is it something you kind of when COVID hit, you're like, you know what, we should probably have a solo version of this. 
Right, yeah, so, so the AI version wasn't in the earliest versions of the game. And when we ran the Kickstarter for the first time, we didn't have an AI version. Mm. Um, and one of the, the kind of bits of feedback we got was the game looks great, but I'm predominantly a solo player. I would love to be able to sort of play this solo. Um, so that's something that we went away and spent the year working on. We really wanted to make sure that we didn't just have a kind of, I don't know, soft AI that was just sort of tacked on or a solo mode that was just sort of tacked on. Yeah. Um, we really wanted to sort of make sure we had a, a seriously good mode that we were proud of. So we spent quite a long time on that. And what we ended up with was a system where you have these, these AIs, these bots, which you can just play against as a solo player, but you can also integrate them into higher player count games as well. So if you're playing a two player game or a three player game with sort of human players and you're like, oh, I'm, I want to see how it plays with sort of a fourth player, you can introduce an, an AI into the game and it, it works just as well. And, and how does that function? Is it, is it the role of a die or, or what, what is it that determines the movements and decisions of that AI? Right. So there's a little bit of dice rolling to determine where the AI moves, um, but that's pretty much the extent of the dice rolling. So the, so the AI has only three different actions. Um, and obviously when we designed the game to begin with, it was definitely done on purpose and not sort of a pure coincidence, but it turns out that going from left to right um, on your player board is quite a natural sequence of moves. Mm. It's not always gonna be optimal. It's not what you're always gonna to want to do as a human player, but it, it sort of works quite nicely. You end up doing quite sensible things. So that's what we sort of noticed to begin with. And then we were like, okay, we want to design an AI, a bot. And what we'll do is we'll have it going from left to right in this kind of natural sequence. So it's doing sort of sensible things on the board. Um, so we started off with that and then we needed to sort of strengthen some of its, um, some of its actions because it's actually not a human player. So it can't react in the same way that a human being can. Um, so we needed to strengthen some of its actions. We needed some decision procedures so that the AI knew exactly what it was going to do. Hmm. Um, we spent some time making sure these decision procedures were as sort of streamlined as possible, so it required the minimum amount of upkeep. upkeep. Um, so it was, a, it was kind of a long process, but we, we ended up with an AI that um, yeah, we, we really like. Um, we're, they're tough. They're tough to beat. Oh, it's tough um, to beat them, I was going to ask, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when I play against an AI, I lose pretty much all the time. <laughs> um, Charlotte is, is very good at the game. Um, she, she beats me sort of nine times out of ten. And, and she can sort of fairly consistently beat the AI, but it's very, very close. So if you guys work those stats, because um, I've often heard that too, is that there's a balance, right? When you create a solo mode or you, you want to have it challenging enough that, um, you know, people aren't bored and they want to keep coming back, but you don't want it too challenging that it feels like they'll, they never have a chance of winning. So how did you strike that balance? Um, so primarily just with lots of play testing. I mean, we would play against the AI and it would just completely smash us and there was no hope at all. And we're like, oh, that's, <laughs> that's too strong. Um, and then we'd tweak and, and we'd win very comfortably and we didn't have to think about it too much. And we're like, oh, well, <laughs> that's too weak. So just with this kind of constant sort of play testing and going back and forth and sort of getting other people to, to try it out as well. Um, that was kind of how we we narrowed down um, exactly sort of the difficulty level it should be. Um, so, so we've ended up with something which, you know, it's definitely winnable, but you, you have to think and you, you're not gonna win every time. It's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be a real challenge, um, which is sort of what I feel like a solo experience should be. Um, so yeah. hopefully people, <laughs> people agree. Um, it, is there a big difference between the different gods? So like, is there an advantage to pick one over the other or they all have their own kind of unique benefits, but they kind of balance each other out or how does that work? Right. So um, all the different gods have their own unique ability, which on the face of it looks quite subtle. So they're, they're sort of small abilities, which affect the way that they do one of the four actions in a, in a fairly small way. Um, but if you're sort of trying to play optimally, um, you end up with really quite radically different strategies depending on which god you pick. So they're all following the same basic rules. Um, so, so for contrast, like in Root, each of the factions have very different kind of rules that they play by. In, in Theogy, you're all playing by the same rules, but the, the strategy that you want to adopt really is quite different depending on um, your deity's power. 
Um, so just for example, there is there is one um, deity whose acolytes are able to preach much faster than other people. Mm. So you want you want them to be sort of pilgrimaging a little bit more and you want to try and get your acolytes into settlements where preaching is going to be particularly effective. There is another deity who is able to take the divine intervention action repeatedly. So for them, it's going to be really good if you've got sort of lots of monsters on the board, because then you're using those monsters again and again and again. Um, so these these kind of subtle differences in the in the deity's abilities end up yeah leading to quite different play styles. Yeah, and I guess allows a kind of mix up from game to game too, right? So you can try with a you know different deity, and next game I'm going to play with a different one, and mm. your game experience can be completely different, and you can try to master I guess the different styles and find out which one kind of fits your play style the best. Mm. Now this game has is it over 500 pieces? Did I get that count right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it has a it has a lot of pieces. That's the a number, lot of pieces. Yeah. Um, so the game is much simpler than the number of its pieces might suggest in terms of sort of core rules. Um, so that there are, if you've got the kind of the basic version of the game, um, you've got lots of cubes which represent the the population. Um, and if you've got sort of the deluxe version, the divine version, then you've got meeples to sort of represent the population. Um, so there are a lot of pieces, but lots of these pieces serve a kind of similar function. Um, so so it's not too overwhelming. Um, but yes, <laughs> making our first game a game which um, had quite so many pieces definitely brought <laughs> brought challenges. And when I was looking at, it, I was thinking, wow, this like what does it weigh like a box like is it is it a heavy box so lighter than you might think um the cubes are pretty light but yeah you got a lot right yeah so the kind of core version of the game is just a little bit over two kilos so it's not not too bad and then when you add in the kind of deluxe stuff it gets a little bit heavier but um but still sort of just over three kilos it's not um it's not a sort of really heavy box that you can sort of i know it's not light either (laughs) it's not light i suppose (laughs) but it's no no replacement for going to the gym (laughs) exactly uh... so and and you so walk me through a little bit of the difference between this campaign and the last campaign so um the one thing i noticed was um a lot more custom pieces i guess on the i guess you're called the divine level is it Mm -hmm. um where you have instead of cubes for the population you've got meeples for the population um in the standard version you've got um like kind of that standard classic little church cut out meeple for your mm-hmm. for your for your um your temples in the divine version you actually have custom so what was the what was the decision process you went through to create those two different bands and i believe you didn't have that on the first time around right mm-hmm. so why the change Yeah, so that's definitely the biggest difference between the two campaigns is this new campaign. We have the divine version with all these custom components. Which all Um, look cool, by the way. I'll just throw that out there. (laughs) Thank you very much. Especially the monsters, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're really, really pleased with, um, with the ones we've got. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the main reason for this is this was the biggest bit of feedback we got from backers. It was like, oh, you know, the game looks kind of cool, but I don't really want a game with just lots of cubes um, and then sort of standard cardboard tokens. I'd like a game which sort of really looks good on the table, um, which I think is kind of totally fair enough. I mean, I, I like my games to look beautiful as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that was a really big thing that we did is we went away and we had these custom components designed and made sure we had a game which sort of people who really wanted sort of custom high quality components um, had, had an option. Um, but at the same time, we didn't want to kind of introduce all these custom components and then have a game which was sort of too expensive for the people that had backed us in the first campaign um, or just for some of our friends who we knew you know really wanted this game um, but weren't that fussed about custom components actually quite liked cubes mm-hmm. um, so so that's why we ended up having these these sort of two tiers um, and the pricing's changed too right so i think in the last time it had like i think it was 59 pounds was your yeah. standard pledge where you've kind of went above and below that right so now your standard pledge is 39 pounds uh, and then kind of the premium divine pledge level is now 69 pounds, right? So mm-hmm. if people want the, the the premium elements, they can get those. It's going to cost a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but people, they want, really love the game, and but they, they want to get in at a, uh, at a lower cost. They can go with the, the, the standard edition too, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So why, why did you pull the first campaign? Maybe walk us mm-hmm. through that. Um, so your first campaign, I believe you raised about $14,000 in, in Canadian dollars again. I don't mm. make it sound bigger. It was about a quarter of your target <laughs> you hit last yeah. time. And it looks like you pulled the campaign about a week into it. So quarter of the way in, quarter of the way funded, you pulled the campaign. What was the thinking behind it? 
Um, so as sort of anyone who's kind of tried to run Kickstarter campaigns before probably found out, it, it tends to be the case that with a campaign, you need to do really quite well in your first sort of 24, 48, maybe 72 hours. Yeah. Um, you need to at least get over 60% by 72 hours to really sort of be in with the shop because the bulk of your, your funding comes in in the first um yeah the first portion of the campaign yeah, yeah exactly um so when we were sort of at 25 percent sort of at, at six or seven days we were like mm, this isn't this isn't going to work we need to sort of step back rethink um you can always sort of try and, and fix the campaign a little bit sort of in the middle but it, it's never going to be enough really you just need to yeah take a step back and and think okay how can i improve mm -hmm. this and, and set myself up better next time um, which is then what we spent a year doing. Um, and what were some of the reasons that you think it failed? Like what, what were some of the lessons learned you had from that first campaign? Um, so that's a good question. So, so one kind of already mentioned is the sort of lack of custom components. Um, the other um, is that we kind of set ourselves a deadline for when we wanted to launch. And then we kind of launch date basically arrived. And in our heart of hearts, we knew we weren't really ready. We were still sort of scrabbling around trying to get mm -hmm. things sorted and done and, and the way we wanted it to look um, but we felt like we'd really tied ourselves to this date so we launched anyway um, and that I think was a was a bit of a mistake um, because I mean to be honest people aren't going to mind if you delay it a little bit um, yeah we've talked about that a ton on this podcast yeah. and you know I always quote uh, Jamie Stagmeyer in his book he, he's, he has a full page on it and he says look if you delay your campaign nothing bad will happen that only happens if you launch before you're ready. And, uh, you know, I took that to heart and, um, you know, my, my upcoming campaign, I've pushed that campaign. I think I've moved the timeline three or four times just based on, you know, it's still not ready. I'm going to push it a little bit further, push it yeah. further until I feel like I'm, I'm there. So, um, it's a hard lesson to learn, I guess, but, um, good yeah. for you guys for coming back at it. <laughs> what are some of the other things you learned from that? So that, that, that's one is going kind of holding yourself to an artificial timeline. Yeah. Um, so, so those are definitely the kind of the big two. I mean, yeah. the, the last time we did it, it was our very first time doing sort of, so we'd backed games on Kickstarter before, but we'd obviously never launched a project before. Yeah. So we didn't really know how it worked. We didn't really sort of weren't totally familiar with the interface. Um, we didn't sort of know exactly um, how we were going to do all the, all the things that we had seen sort of other Kickstarter creators do. So there was all that kind of, nervousness and, and uncertainty and it was really nice not to kind of have any of that this time because we were like okay we we know what's going to happen after we click the launch button we know yep. the information that we're going to be shown we know sort of how to send messages and, and do updates and, and so on um, yeah so that's that one of the downfalls i think from mm -hmm. uh, kickstarter in i mean i experienced this in a lot of uh, a lot of the um, people that have launched kickstarters that i've talked to have said the same thing is there's no real trial way to go through it. You, you hit the button and then you're learning when you're live. Right. Like, and so unfortunately um, you know, that, that can be a little stressful when uh, mm -hmm. you're not exactly sure exactly kind of how it works, but you just got to kind of have faith that it will work and hit the button. And then, mm -hmm. then you're scrambling in some cases because you didn't know what you didn't know. So yeah. Um, you know, maybe in the future, there'll be more videos and so forth to kind of walk you through step-by-step. Step. That'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Kickstarter could do that. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you have to learn from people like yourself who've gone through it and hopefully <laughs> provide some good advice to, uh, to others. Yeah. What did you do to carry over? Uh, so you had over a hundred and some odd backers on that first campaign. Mm -hmm. How did you carry them over? Or did you carry any of those, those backers over? Yeah, so it was, it was really nice, actually, to sort of see people backing this time that I recognized from last time and so that they sent lovely messages and then sort of posted comments. So that was really nice. Um, so, yeah, we, we I think we managed quite well to build a community around the game, especially this the second time. Um, so partly we just had people signing up to a newsletter. I sort of obviously posted an update on the old campaign when the new campaign launched. Um, but we also had a, a Facebook group which was dedicated just to the game. Um, nice. that people could join um, and then I was sort of asking the group for advice on sort of the graphics that we were uploading or advice on the custom components that we were designing um, so I think that really helped to kind of yeah keep people engaged and excited about the project um, even sort of through the year um, when <laughs> sort of right from when the campaign sort of failed the first time through the year until we launched the second time. Yeah I think people definitely like to feel like they're involved in the process mm -hmm. and like their their voice counts and I think from what I've seen, um, usually if somebody backs your campaign, 
if you dust yourself off and come back at it again, many of those people are going to come back again because they believed in you once there's a, you know, they backed you because they, they, they believed in you as much mm-hmm. as they did your game. And to me, I think uh, we talked about this on another podcast where I think, you know, pulling the campaign versus letting it fail um, mm-hmm. sometimes is a way of you signaling to your backers that you've, you know, um, you're able to look in the mirror and, and see that, you know, you're not just blindly charging forward. You're seeing that mm-hmm. something is not working and, and you're going to kind of intervene. Right. So I think that's yeah. appreciated by a lot of people as well. Um, so when, when does this game uh, hit the mark? So you're, you're going, you got 20 more, two days more of uh, pledging. Mm-hmm. And then when do you fulfill this game? Um, so the date we've set for fulfillment is September, 2022. So 18 months from now. So 18 months. So typically games take, you know, it could be like a year, I guess, mm. uh, is kind of, but so this is a little bit longer than the average, what was the rationale behind that? Um, so a, a few things. So one is obviously this is our, our first project and we want to make sure we do everything right. We don't rush every, anything. We sort of make sure all the boxes are, are properly uh, ticked and sort of thoroughly checked. Um, so that was one sort of very basic reason. Um, the other reason, if you, if you look at the game, you'll notice that there is an absolute ton of artwork required for this game. Yeah. Um, so some of the artwork is done already and it's sort of showcased on the page. Some of the art is still in its sort of rough prototype form and needs sort of a bit of finishing off. Um, but there's still a lot of artwork to do. Um, so we needed to sort of make sure we gave our artists time to, to get that done as well. Yeah. Um, we could have sort of set it for 12 months and sort of our, our real hope is that we will be able to fulfill before September 2022, but it just, sure. it seemed a bit kind of dishonest to sort of set this artificially early date um, to kind of, yeah, it, it just felt a little bit deceitful. We were like, mm, not sure. Um, this way we'll be able to say, look, you will, you know, we're, we're pretty confident you will have the game by September 22. Um, yeah, I think it's being honest with your with your backers, right? And, yeah. and you know, people always are appreciative when you're early, mm. and not super happy when you're even a day late, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if you can go early, that's better. And, and yeah. is this being manufactured in China? Like, where are you manufacturing the game? No, so we're actually manufacturing in Germany. Uh, with oh wow, lead effect. Yeah. Um, so so there are a couple of reasons for this, um, but one was just that we were really really impressive with. Uh, impressed with Ludafax kind of environmental standards and their, mm. and their record. Um, they're big into using sort of recycled or recyclable materials, using green energy for their manufacturing and for their associate. Um, so we're working with their fulfillment partner as well, Ludo Pact, who, who also sort of uses green energy. Um, so we were really impressed by that. And um, yeah, we were sort of wanting to make sure that we we were sort of working with, with partners like that. That was one of a big motivation for. Oh, that's that's awesome. Them. And I noticed on your Kickstarter page, there's a little paragraph dedicated to that. Also talking about, you know, how sustainable you guys are and how you're doing your best to uh, take a green approach to it, which I don't think enough campaigns do. So it's, uh, it's really refreshing to see when, uh, when someone does that. Um, so Oliver, I just want to say uh, congrats. Hey, this is, uh, this has been amazing so far, eight days in uh, you guys got to be on cloud nine. <laughs> I can't wait to see where this is going to land. I'm sure it's going to land way higher than you initially imagined. So uh, <laughs> it looks like a fun game. And uh, certainly there's a lot of people that are excited to, uh, to get it. How best can they follow you uh, if they want to kind of follow this journey along or if they want to participate, maybe even some of the artwork that's up and coming? How, do, how did you do that? Um, cool. So um, the Ministry of Meeples has a Facebook page, which you can sort of like and follow, but also um, the game Theogy has its own Facebook group, which okay. everyone is welcome to join. So, um, so yeah, that's probably the best way to stay really up to date with everything that's going on. Is, is oh, that's joining awesome. The Facebook group. And if anybody wants to uh, follow this Kickstarter campaign, pledge in this Kickstarter campaign, it is one beefy game. I can tell you that. Check it out. I even love the video. I mean, the video sucks you right in on the top of this page check it out. I'll put the Kickstarter link in the show notes, uh, both on YouTube, as well as in the Facebook live, as well as in the audio podcast that goes out. Any one of those areas, you can find the link. They'll take you straight to it. Or you can, uh, you can just go, I guess, onto the Kickstarter page and look for uh, Theurgy, which is spelled uh, T-H-E-U-R-G-Y. And it will take you right to the page. Oliver, all the best. Thanks for coming on the camp on the uh, on the podcast. I really appreciate it. You take care. Yeah, thank you so much, James. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge Podcast, hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner, with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge, and you'll get access to live interviews, 
giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time. We'll be right back.